So, well, welcome. My name is John Wall. I'm here at the uh, Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, and I'm enjoying having the chance to welcome Zaki back. Uh, for a while, he was here at the Center as a research fellow, and he was one of those enjoyable people having down the hall that you could always have some really interesting conversation with him. Uh, he is currently professor uh, and the Betty Zaman Nursi Chair in Islamic Studies at John Carroll University up in Ohio. Uh, he has a PhD in theology, uh, and he works in a variety of disciplines and works both textually and historical con in historical contexts and so on. Um, and uh, you've got his subject today is based, let me... Uh, is building around his uh, now 2014 book, uh, Islam's Jesus, uh, and I look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Welcome, welcome back to the center, Zach. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be back to Georgetown again. Uh, so, um, as John said, I will be talking about uh, Jesus in Islam, but. In order to draw your attention, uh, uh, I would like to ask you some questions so that make sure that you are awake uh, and no one <laughs> is sleeping. Uh, is there a chapter in the Quran named after Jesus? This question is for all, including Muslims. No chapter in the Quran? I would say no. No. Anyone who would say yes? Well, to, if you say yes, I'm going to reach out to them, perhaps. So, looks like you say no, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the list of the Quranic chapters, there is no chapter. But I found that there is a chapter in the Quran named after Jesus, chapter Al-Saf, uh, which is chapter 61 of the Quran. Uh, it has three names. One is Al-Saf, which means, you know, like a roll, an angel sign in the roll, that's, you know, related to a subject in the, in the chapter. And the second name of this chapter is Al-Hawaryun, disciples, mm -hmm. disciples of Jesus. And the third name of this chapter is Isa, mm -hmm. Jesus. So I think there's a surprise for all of you, because uh, we don't know that there's a chapter in the Quran about Jesus, and I, I am sure that if I ask you know, a group of Muslims in the similar gathering, they will not know as well. Uh, do Muslims believe in the second coming of Jesus? Yes. 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 That's good. Um, what is the most frequently used title for Jesus in the Quran? Say, Musa. Isa. Isa is his name. Isa. Ibn Maria, right? Yeah. Bravo. Ibn Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the son of Mary, bravo. Okay, so everybody is awake, then I can start now. <laughs> so who was Jesus? Let's start with this. Uh, my plan is to speak for uh, 45 minutes, and then, of course, I will uh, uh, answer your questions. You know, we will have a good uh, section on uh, QA. Uh, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, this is a principle uh, in Islam that, uh, um, uh, like Christianity, Mary was not touched by any human being. The, the birth of Jesus was a miracle. Uh, I think uh, scholars uh, agree that uh, Islam, with this regard, is the only religion that agrees with Christianity with regard to the birth of Jesus, that it was a miracle, a, a divine uh, a miracle that God uh, created Jesus with no any physical father. Uh, bringer of, it, of peace. The, the role of Jesus in the eschatological uh, sense is to bring peace. <coughs> so Jesus is a peacemaker at the same time in the Islamic tradition. Uh, one of the five elite prophets in Islam, along with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Muhammad. Um, now, when we say five elite prophets, this is very significant because I know that in the Christian tradition, and sometimes in the English speaking world, when we say prophets, uh, it is not so high as we understand in Islam. 
Because uh, prophet, <coughs> sometimes anyone who speaks about future can be called prophet. But with this regard, five elite prophets. First of all, prophets are very important in Islam. But these five elite prophets, I would call them like the stars of humanity. Uh, if we consider human beings from the beginning of humanity until the end of time, let's say 150 billion people, or maybe 200 billion people, among all of these, there are five who are the greatest. And these are five people, five prophets. So they, with this regard, forget Aristotle, forget Socrates, uh, forget all those people. The highest are these five uh, messengers of God. And these are um, uh, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. So Jesus is one of these five elite prophets uh, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, he is um, also a Muslim, uh, intentionally, I put with lowercase m, uh, the one who submits himself to the will of God. So the Quran speaks of Jesus as a Muslim. Well, similarly, it speaks of Moses as a Muslim, it speaks of the disciples of Jesus as, as Muslim. They submitted themselves to the will of God. Uh, so that's why... Um, Sometimes we say is also with uppercase level. Some people would say even with uppercase level, Jesus is a Muslim. But uppercase level, uh, I mean, the, the, technically, it is not because it starts with the prophet of Islam and it's clearly uh, 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 it's evident that Jesus was before the prophet of Islam. So that's why I put with lowercase m. He's a miracle worker. Uh, Jesus... Uh, um, makes miracles. So Jesus is uh, in the Quran um, we know that he, he, he had many miracles. He was able to show miracles to his people to uh, convince them about his, uh, his truthfulness. Uh, in Islamic tradition uh, miracles are given to the prophets to show that they are truly uh, speaking on behalf of God. They are not speaking in vain, they are not speaking on behalf of themselves. They are representing God. And that's why sometimes God changes his natural laws for their sake. And Jesus was one of them. He would be able to make miracles that were unusual and sometimes unnatural. Uh, he is also an intercessor. Um, in the Islamic tradition, uh, Jesus has the power of intercession. In the afterlife, the concept of intercession is, is an important theme in the Islamic theology. In the afterlife, uh, prophets of God are able to intercede, especially high prophets like Jesus, Moses, uh, the prophet of Islam, Abraham. Uh, God allows them to intercede in the afterlife. So um, let's say uh, a sinful person uh, Jesus may ask God to forgive this person. Uh, sometimes in modern uh, terms, I use uh, uh, the term recommendation letter. You know, like <coughs> recommendation, you write a recommendation letter. That person may not be high, but you recommend that it will be high. Uh, so in the same way, these prophets may ask God to forgive them, but it's up to God. It's God who makes the decision whether these people will be forgiven or not. So, Jesus in primary Islamic sources, um, the Quran, as you know, the major source of Islam, anything in the Quran, even a small hint is very important. Even a small hint. Because it is the main source uh, uh, of Islam. The second important source uh, is Hadith. We, uh, I will elaborate on these sources uh, with regard to Jesus. A hadith uh, is known as the sayings of the prophet. It's a term used for the sayings of the prophet. Uh, we have uh, a very uh, extensive scholarship on the hadith, uh, even in our time. And it, uh, it is uh, a field uh, of variety of disciplines uh, in the Islamic tradition. 
so I have no time to elaborate on, on all aspects of hadith. But hadith also is very important because it is uh, related to the Prophet. So the Prophet is the one who said it. If he has said it, it's very important. That's, you know, uh, uh, that's why it's the second important source in Islam. Now with, the, with regard to the Quran, uh, Jesus mentioned in more than 60 verses, uh, 90 verses of the Quran, excuse me, more than 90 verses of the Quran, um, characterized by his message. Jesus' personality is important, but more important than that is his message, the message of Jesus, uh, because that is the reason for uh, God sending Jesus to humanity, to, to lay the message of God to human beings. Uh, and this message is in Jill, the gospel. Uh, now, uh, as we will uh, um, a little bit elaborate uh, on uh, um, this concept, uh, the Quran uses singular uh, term for in Jill. It is one gospel. The Quran speaks of one gospel. Like the Quran. Uh, in fact, when Muslims uh, teach their children, uh, they say we believe in four great books of God. Uh, Torah, uh, revealed to David. Um, uh, Psalms, uh, revealed, uh, Torah revealed to Moses. Uh, Psalms, uh, revealed to David. Um, uh, gospel, uh, uh, Injil, revealed to Jesus, and Quran, revealed uh, to uh, Prophet Muhammad. So, uh, these are in the same category, the Quran, uh, uh, the Gospel, the Psalms, and, uh, uh, the, uh, and, and the Torah. And that's why when Muslims think of these books, they have the same concept in their mind. It was a book revealed to Jesus. The Gospel was a book revealed to Jesus. That's, you know, Muslims' understanding of the Gospel. Some of the um, uh, uh, verses that speak of Jesus, uh, j chapter 3, verse 49, 53. Uh, Surely I came to you with a sign from your Lord. I create from clay the likeness of a bird. Then I breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by God's permission. Now, by God's permission, that is... Um, I think the significant part uh, in the Islamic tradition because Jesus was able to make miracles not because of his own power but it was because the power that God gave him. So it, that's why it is by God's permission. It's by God's power. Uh, and it continues, the verse continues. I heal those born blind and the leper. And I resurrect the dead by God's permission again. I announce unto you about what you eat and what you store up in your houses. Surely, in all of this, there is a sign for you if you are believers. So all of these miracles that Jesus shows are signs uh, for human beings. That's why he says, if you are believers. If you believe, these are signs. Another, uh, again, in the same chapter, another verse. Uh, I have come confirming that which was before me of the Torah and to make lawful to you part of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a proof from your Lord. So fear God and obey me. And the verse continues again. Uh, Truly God is my Lord and your Lord. So worship only him, worship only God. And this is a very significant principle in Islam that no one can be worshipped except God. So for example, uh, Prophet Muhammad cannot be worshipped. Uh, Jesus cannot be worshipped. Moses cannot be worshipped. Mary cannot be worshipped. Only God uh, to be worshipped. Uh, Yes, they are great worshippers of God, but they are not to be worshipped in Islam. And that's why in this Quranic language, Jesus says, 
Worship your Lord. Worship God. So no worship for any other human beings. The verse uh, again continues. Uh, when, then when Jesus came to know of their disbelief, he said, who will be my helpers in God's cause? The disciples, known as al Hawariyun, said, we are the helpers of God. We believe in God and bear witness that we are Muslims. Again, with lowercase m, we are Muslims, uh, submitting ourselves to the will of God. Our Lord, we believe in what you have sent down, and we follow the messenger. So, count us among the witnesses. Faktubna ma shahidin. Make us the witness of the truth, among the witnesses of the truth. Another uh, Quranic verse in chapter 5, um, verse 46, 47. Here again, Jesus confirms the Torah and receiving a new message from God, the gospel. In this verse, we see, uh, as Jesus is not an isolated person, but Jesus is a continuation of the divine message that came through Abraham, Moses, and now Jesus. And that's why this Quranic verse says, and in their footsteps, in their footsteps, the footsteps of Abraham, uh, uh, Moses, and other prophets, uh, we sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, again, confirms the Torah. Jesus does not reject the Torah, but confirms the Torah. And we gave him the gospel in jail, in which was guidance and light. So gospel is important for Muslims, again, because the Quran refers to this book as a book that has guidance and light in it. And confirmation of the Torah that had come before it. Again, the Torah um, that is a guidance and admonition for the pious. These two references to books, uh, uh, divine books, in the Quran referred uh, very frequently, and in this case, Jesus is the one who receives one of them, which is the gospel, and confirms the previous one, which is the Torah. In chapter 61, the chapter that I, I mentioned that this chapter, for those who came earlier, I mean came late, um, this chapter is also known as Jesus in the Quran. Uh, I, I had a question and I asked, uh, uh, you know, do you know that if there is a chapter in the Quran named after Jesus? So this chapter has a, na another name called uh, um, Jesus. In this chapter we see, uh, again, uh, disciples of Jesus. In this case, they say, we are, uh, who, my, who are my helpers in God's cause? And disciples would say, we are your helpers in God's cause. And a group of the children of Israel believed, while another group disbelieved. Then we strengthened those who believed against their foe, and they became the uppermost. We strengthened those who believed uh, in Jesus of the children of Israel. Now, like I, uh, now I like to move to another uh, aspect of. Uh, uh, Jesus in Islam, and that is what we call it the descent of Jesus. Uh, the uh, scholars will call it Nuzul Isa in Arabic. Uh, the this I translate it as the descent of Jesus. In the Christian tradition, this is known as the second coming of Jesus. But uh, Muslims, uh, when they say Nuzul, uh, the word Nuzul indicates that it comes from above. It comes from high place, uh, comes down. So coming from heaven to earth. Uh, the descent of Jesus from heaven to earth. We can put that way. Uh, and this is not related at all uh, to the Christian concept of the descent of Jesus from heaven to hell so that see the situation of the people of hell. But that is not related to that. Uh, this descent is very specific term in the Islamic tradition. Uh, so, 
with this regard, uh, there are three approaches. And I would say, if I say there are hundred, more than hundred books written on this in the Islamic literature, I am not exaggerating. I put many of them in my book. Uh, you know, I look at them, uh, I found interesting points. And I categorized all of these references, all of these ideas into three categories. One, uh, I call it um, modernist approach. Um, philosophical modernist approach, maybe put it much more uh, accurately. Uh, so not all modern philosophers, but many of them, uh, I said some, do not accept the authenticity of the texts. Uh, for example, um, they would say these texts that we have, uh, let's say, uh, about the coming of Jesus, these are um, not reliable. These are not authentic stated. Uh, uh, and that's why they do not accept it. They say there is an influence of Christianity on Islam, and that's why all these texts are actually coming from the Christian tradition to Islam. Uh, there are some scholars, I found them. Yeah. Are these Quranic texts you're talking about? No, because I will come to that. Not the Quranic texts, but Hadith. Most hadith. Uh, because there is no direct reference in the Quran about that. The, the second one is the literalist approach. The literal approach is uh, accepting Jesus uh, as a, uh, Jesus coming or Jesus descent as a real factual thing. They say definitely the person of Jesus will come from sky, everybody will see him, uh, even if you like you can take his picture, uh, he will come down and people will see him. And when, when you say how this can happen, they say God is the most powerful. <coughs> Yeah, there is a verse in the Quran uh, which says, um, God is all powerful uh, over everything. So, with, through the power of God, a person can come from the sky you know, to earth. Uh, it's very literal. The interpretive approach, <coughs> which I favor, actually, um, accepts the descent of Jesus, but in a different way. They say, uh, yes. There are many references uh, about the descent of Jesus. It's not like one hadith, two hadiths. Many. Uh, Al-Kashmiri, prominent, prominent Indian scholar, put together 100 saints of the prophet. Uh, 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 and in fact, he dedicated a book only uh, uh, compiling the saints of the prophet on this. So yes, there are some uh, fabricated hadith, but there are many reliable hadith according to the hadith methodology. And that's why it's not easy to say, well, all of these are fabricated, they are you know, under the influence of Christianity. It's not easy to say that. Uh, so this, this interpretive approach uh, says uh, that uh, there is the coming of Jesus, there is the descent of Jesus, but not in a literal way. The prophet speak, uh, the prophet spoke in a symbolic language. And that's why there's a symbolism in this, in this uh, tradition, in this uh, uh, sayings of the prophet. I found interesting approaches, and I will share with you uh, some of them. Well, the prophet uh, spoke in, a, in an allegorical language. Uh, one example that I found, which is also mentioned in Al-Bukhari, uh, Aisha, the wife of the prophet, narrates. She says, we asked the prophet, who would be the first meeting with you in the afterlife? That is to say, which of us will die first to meet you in the afterlife? And the prophet said, the one whose hands are the longest. Aisha says, we started to... Um, measure our hands, whose hands is the longest. <coughs> but after the death of the prophet, Zainab passed away, whose hands was the shortest. She was the smallest among us. We understood that the prophet meant the one who gives charity the most. <laughs> so in the Arabic language, there are some symbolic 
terms. There are some allegorical terms. Well, the long, uh, the longness of hands means the one who gives charity more. And that's why the prophet meant actually the one who gives charity the most. So we understood after that. Similarly, scholars would say the prophet used allegorical language about the descent of Jesus as well. And with this, uh, I will explain some of these meanings of these uh, 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 sayings of the prophet. Now, um, before going to the uh, interpretive approach, I'd like to say a few words about how this is mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith. Um, now, in the Quran, there are hints. Uh, I found four uh, Quranic verses that uh, scholars believe that there are some hints in this. Uh, one of these is um, Jesus will speak to humanity from his cradle and in manhood and is of the righteous. Those uh, who are uh, considering this um, uh, this verse as a reference to the descent of Jesus, they say um, when Jesus speaks in manhood, that means when he descends from heaven, then he will he will speak. Um, well, Jesus spoke from his cradle. This is a tradition. This is in the Quran, actually. Uh, you might know this uh, story, which is in the Quran. Because it's in the Quran, it is important. Uh, when Mary uh, gave birth uh, uh, to Jesus, she brought her to her people. Uh, the Quran is very explicit about this. They said, where did you get this baby? Uh, I think I, I have the exact statement on um, Mary, you have surely commit, committed a terrible thing. Your father was not a wicked man, nor was you, your mother a woman unchaste. So Mary, uh, as, as a part of inspiration or revelation from God, she was not speaking. She was silent. But she pointed to the baby as if she was saying, don't ask me, ask the baby. And the baby responded. Uh, baby Jesus responded. Um, uh, then Jesus speaks. Uh, he says, um, I am God's servant. God has given me the book and made me a prophet and has made me blessed wherever I may be. Peace be upon me when I was born. Peace be upon me when I am grown up. Peace be upon me when I die. The, this is a very interesting, and I found, uh, uh, you know, God made me blessed. Um, so Jesus, with this statement from his cradle, and scholars who comment uh, who comment on this verse, they say Jesus never spoke after that until the age of speaking. It was a miracle, and. Uh, he indicated the innocence of his mother with this, uh, with this talk. And that's why Mary was pointing to Jesus. So this is one of the verses. The second verse, which is much more direct reference, it's believed to be much more direct reference, uh, Jesus is a sign for the hour. Now the hour is the end of time, the final hour of human history. And Jesus is known in the, uh, as this Quranic, uh, verse refers uh, is is a reference to that is a sign to the hour to the final moment of human history. I found that scholars are divided into two groups with regard to this verse. One group of scholars would say Jesus is a sign because he was created with no father uh, as as a divine miracle, um, so that the one who created Jesus this way <coughs> is powerful to bring after life as well. Another group of scholars would say, uh, Jesus himself is a sign. When Jesus comes, when Jesus descends, that means it is uh, near uh, of the end of the world, when Jesus descends. So they consider this as a reference to the descent of Jesus. 
So with that regard, it's not direct, it's not very literal reference, but they are considered as hints at the descent of Jesus. And there are several other verses. Coming to hadith, uh, in the hadith, in the body of hadith, of course, uh, what I am saying uh, is, uh, I would say, the summary of the summary of the summary of the book. So the book uh, has a larger uh, 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 on this um, on this subject. I think a long chapter uh, I dedicated to the hadith literature on, on Jesus. So I am mentioning only two hadith. I think two three hadith. Um, here the prophet <coughs> says, "By God Almighty, in whose hand my soul is, Jesus, the Son of Mary, will soon descend among you Muslims as a just ruler." Now, the, the, the role of Jesus in this regard is a just ruler. So Jesus comes as a just ruler. Um, so bringing of justice is actually the major, uh, um, the major role that is related to Jesus in the in the hadith. Another hadith, um, and this is about the dream of the prophet. The prophet sees Jesus in his dream. It's very interesting hadith because in this hadith we see the features of Jesus, which is not very well known in Christian tradition. I think <laughs> several of my colleagues told me that we don't have any reference about the feature of Jesus. Uh, well, generally we we see him as a blonde person, you know, in the uh, in, in the American context. Uh, it depends on the church, you know, which church. Uh, it, the church that you go. Um, but in this hadith, it's very interesting. Jesus is a man of brown color, as you see. Uh, it has been shown to me while I was sleeping in my dream, while I was circumambulating the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the holy shrine of Islam. I saw a man of brown color. The best one can see among brown colored human beings. Yeah, brown color. And the hadith continues. Uh, his hair was so long that it fell between his shoulders. Among the best hairs uh, one can see. He had combed his hair and it was as if water was dripping from his head. And he was on the shoulders of two men circumambulating the Kaaba. Jesus is on the shoulders of two men circumambulating the Kaaba. I asked, who is this? They replied, this is Jesus, the son of Mary. So in this hadith, we see uh, the features of Jesus, the color of Jesus, the hero of Jesus. Uh, Jesus circumambulating the Kaaba. Uh, so there are symbolic uh, meanings in these hadith, and scholars have elaborated on these uh, uh, symbols as well. But I think the significant part uh, is that we see some features of Jesus. And in the Arabic language, generally, the concept of uh, dripping water from someone's head indicates, uh, you know, like a well, uh, um, um, well-dressed, well-behaved, you know, all things are beautiful with regard to this personality. <coughs> another, <coughs> excuse me, another hadith says, uh, <coughs> the prophet, um, again, speaks of the, <coughs> excuse me, speaks of the Islamic community. Uh, surely Jesus, the Messiah, now here Jesus is the Messiah. The title given to Jesus is al Messiah, the Messiah. <coughs> Jesus will find some people from among my community as his helpers. And we see among the messengers of God in this hadith, uh, it also gives us this <coughs> idea that there is no jealousy. That my helpers 
<coughs> my communities are helping Jesus. That's why the prophet says, he will find some people from my community as his helpers. And then it, the hadith has more actually. Uh, <coughs> who are like you, addressing to his own community, those people who will be helping Jesus are like you or even better than you. The prophet repeated, the narrator says, the prophet repeated this three times. They are like you or even better than you. God will not disgrace a community of which I am the beginning and Jesus the end. So here we see Jesus is the end. He comes at the end. And the prophet is at the beginning, so this community of Islam will not be disgraced because I am the beginning, Jesus the end. So the community is between two prophets of God, two messengers of God. Uh, some Sufi literature uh, on this, uh, I found, uh, and I mentioned, I think, uh, many other Sufi, but here I like to also only focus on Rumi. Uh, Rumi spoke about the power of the breath of Jesus. Uh, not the physicality of that breath, but the power hidden in, in that breath. Uh, Rumi likens a human being to the breath of Jesus. The physical aspect of the breath, Rumi says, is weak. Well, breath is considerably weak. But how about a breath that resurrects a person to, to life from death? And that is as very strong. So the, there is a very strong inner aspect of both the breath and human being. So human being physically can be weak. But there is a spirit in human being, a control being, that likes like the inner aspect of the breath of Jesus. And that's why, <coughs> excuse me, human being can be higher than angels and can be lower than Jesus because of this dimension, the inner dimension of human being. Uh, Jesus is also known as the prophet of love in the Islamic tradition. Scholars have <coughs> elaborated on this. Rumi has elaborated extensively on this. But I love this statement by Nursi, which is re-emphasized by some Islamic scholars uh, today. Um, to love, love, and to hate, hatred. Uh, if you love, love, love will increase. If you hate, hatred, it will decrease. Uh, scholars, especially Nursi, mentioned this in much earlier time. Uh, Fethullah Gülen is repeatedly now saying this statement. Uh, and it is um, because Jesus is known as the prophet of love, uh, it is coming from that uh, dimension uh, of the teaching of Jesus. Now, coming to the interpretive approach, uh, which I said I favored, and that's why I'm elaborated on that approach. Muhammad Abdu is very interesting. He is known as a modernist uh, in, in modern time, uh, but he is uh, different than other modernist philosophers. Uh, he speaks of the descent of Jesus. The descent of Jesus and his ruling on earth can be interpreted as the dominance of his spirit and his enigmatic message to people. Uh, this is what uh, dominates Jesus as a teachings of uh, uh, commanding mercy, love, and peace. So his, uh, the, uh, his understanding uh, of Jesus' descent is the dominance of mercy, love, and peace, which are the essence of the teaching of Jesus. Muhammad Abdul understand that way. Uh, and he has m more, um, uh, he says, the time of Jesus' descent is a time when people take the spirit of religion and the spirit of Islamic law to heart to reform their inner life without sticking to the forms and appearances. And he, he finds sticking to the forms and appearances problematic. Because when you look at the 
legal dimensions only without looking at the spirit of it, well, many times you will become literalist. And actually, you will be misled. And unfortunately, today we have this problem in the Islamic society and in the Islamic world. People are interpreting one verse literally without knowing the essence of it or forcing people to pray, you know, like going to pray, forcing. Well, when you pray even, if there's no sincerity in it, that prayer is not accepted. You have to do it from your heart, not appearance. Uh, so similar to type, those type of things. Uh, and that could be even sometimes uh, in the form of extremism, sticking to the, to the literal uh, aspect of the text may lead to extremism and it leads to extremism today, unfortunately. So that's another story. I have no time to get into that story. But the idea is that the, in the time of Jesus, Abdul said, this people will be concerned about the spirit of religion, the essence of religion, which is much more important uh, than the appearance. Uh, Ermalı Muhammed Hamdi Yazar is a prominent Turkish commentator of the Quran, a contemporary commentator. He understands, uh, also he, uh, I put um, in the appendix, a section from his comment, uh, commentary, translated the first time that is translated to English, actually. Um, he says, the word of Jesus did not have any other meaning than the word of Tawheed. Jesus basically indicates Tawheed, uh, the, the oneness of God. Uh, he understands that, you know, with that regard, um, Christianity is a monotheistic religion. Judaism is a monotheistic religion. Islam is a monotheistic religion. So Jesus is not more than Tawheed. No, uh, no other, any, uh, no, no any other things than that. Um, the real uh, spirit of the Torah and the Gospel is solely this Tawheed. If you look at the spirit uh, that Jesus presented, which is the Gospel, and of course the Torah. He refers to the Torah as the book revealed to Moses. Uh, again. That is Tawhid, uh, the oneness of God. Tawhid means the oneness of God. His another uh, um, quote from him: Jesus is an is Jesus is an unusual, abstract word of God. Well, in the Quran, yes, Jesus uh, uh, referred to as the word of God. Um, that is to say, it is because of his ability to miraculously resurrect the dead. He was able to resurrect the dead. The Quran speaks of this miracle of Jesus. <coughs> um, a blessing from God that is mostly denied by people. It was a blessing, a miracle from God that he was able to resurrect the dead. And that is because he was an unusual abstract word of God. This is what... Uh, Muhammad Hamdi Yazir interprets. Now, I like the interpretation of uh, Bediou Zaman, uh, Said Nusi. Uh, he is one of the uh, earliest, I would say, scholars, like Abdul, uh, who elaborated on this uh, uh, aspect of Islamic theology, uh, Jesus in the Islamic theology. Uh, he's, he uh, suggests that the, the descent of Jesus has something to do with dialogue between Muslims and Christians to bring justice and peace to our world. Well, he's saying this uh, in 1911. In 1911, uh, 50 years before the Nusra Ayat happened, uh, that Christians and Muslims should come together and, um, and work together, suggesting that that is significant for the future of humanity. 1911 is too early, very much early. And remember, 1911 was almost two, three years later, we had a, a catastrophe, the First World War. And Nursi, in this period,
period of time was advocating for a cooperation uh, and dialogue. A renewal, he says, the coming of Jesus also means a renewal of Christianity and a return to the original message of Jesus. That is, you know, the meaning uh, of the coming of Jesus. Uh, he says that Muslims and Christians who have dedicated themselves to justice and spiritual life will fulfill the meaning of the descent of Jesus. That is to bring justice and peace to our world. The return to the original message of Jesus will promote cooperation between Muslims and Christians to return to the original message of Jesus. The result will be cooperation between Christians and Muslims. And I think this is significant because when we say Muslims and Christians, uh, uh, we are talking about a huge number of humanity, a huge population of humanity. If we just consider the family of Abraham, uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews coming together, they constitute, I think, about 58% of humanity. And that's a huge number. It can make change. It can make a big change uh, in the world. Uh, well, this is, uh, this understanding of Nursi is uh, rooted in the Quran because he's not speaking, you know, just uh, with no any reference to the Quranic uh, um, teaching. Here we have a verse in the Quran, O people of the book, come to a common word between us. People of the book. In the Quran language, you know, this is a term used for Jews and Christians. Well, the Quran says, O people of the book, Christians and Jews, let's come to a common word between us, that all of us worship none but God. And of course, this is the most uh, uh, common theme, the most, the largest common theme that Muslims, Christians, and Jews uh, can come together. But there are many other uh, common themes that they can uh, elaborate on, and they can uh, cooperate uh, on those themes. Uh, in this case, uh, when they come together, they don't have to sacrifice their identity, their um, uh, because to be different doesn't uh, doesn't prevent people <coughs> from coming together. Because diversity is a divine will in the Quranic language. If God uh, will, He could have made you one community, but God made you different. So. Not necessarily to be the same, but still you can come together. And the verse continues. Uh, he has not made you one community in order to test you with what he has given you. Therefore, vie with one another for good deeds. The return of all of you is to God. He will then inform you about what you have differed on. So why with one another, which means, in this case, have a positive competition for good deeds. Do good things and, and compete with each other in a positive way. And that is, I think, uh, what Nursi understood that, you know, Christian and, and Muslims can come together and compete for good things positively. Dialogue in the Quran, again, is very strong. Um, we have some verses that, you know, there are many verses, but just few of them. When you are greeted, respond with an equal, better greeting. Um, instruct its audience to initiate dialogue with others by showing a way of greeting positively. When you say, peace be with you, you start a beautiful statement. You know, that the, the, the person who is uh, responding to this, the Quran says, let him say even uh, a better one. Peace and blessings be with you. You know, like peace and mercy of God be with you. And that's why, you know, in the Islamic tradition where they say, assalamu alaikum, peace be with you, the person who responds, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. 
he adds something. And God's peace be with you, and also God's mercy be with you. So greeting in a, in a better way, in a higher way. Uh, history of Muslim Christian cooperation. I like to, you know, uh, uh, just give you one example from history, and I think Dr. Bo knows this story better than me. Uh, this is in the um, Islamic tradition when Islam started in 609, according to my uh, uh, research. Some people say 6010, but I found it in 609. The first revelation came to the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he uh, declared his message to his people, but he received a hostile reaction from his community. Uh, his people were tortured, uh, especially um, marginals, uh, uh, vulnerables, were uh, uh, tortured by the elite group of Mecca. So the prophet suggested to his community, to these vulnerable members of his community, to migrate to a different place, to Abyssinia. And the prophet says, there is a Christian king that no one is wrong in his land. And this Christian king known in the Islamic tradition as Najashi. Uh, we have references that uh, 70 companions of the prophet, 50 males, 20 females, have migrated to this land, to uh, Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia. And the king eventually, uh, um, um, yeah, it's a long story, uh, but to, uh, to make it short, uh, the king eventually accepted them uh, and told them that they can stay in Abyssinia uh, as long as they wish. The prophet loved Najashi. Uh, when Najashi passed away, uh, the prophet was in Medina. Uh, the prophet said, today your brother Najashi passed away. Let's have a funeral prayer for him. The Islamic funeral prayer was confirmed for Najashi, the Christian king of, uh, of uh, Ethiopia. And um, it is believed that Najashi was uh, <coughs> corresponding with the prophet, sending messages to the prophet. And this was a very critical time. All these people could be tortured and killed, but this Christian king protected Muslims, and it became a, became a great support for the prophet of Islam. Uh, to, it's very interesting to honor uh, the legacy of Najashi. Today, uh, some Turkish businessmen went to um, Ethiopia and established some schools there, named as, I think I have the name, um, the Najashi Ethio Turkish International Schools. About, about eight schools are running under the name of Najashi, honoring uh, the legacy of Najashi that first happened in the Islamic history. So, historically, Muslims have a very good, uh, you know, this historical event <coughs> suggests that they have a very good uh, relationship. And Nursi suggests that this relationship. Uh, as a part of uh, his understanding of the descent of Jesus should be strengthened and actually uh, turned into cooperation and dialogue. Um, today, there are scholars who are very much involved in this, uh, and I think Fethullah Gülen is one of the pioneers of this dialogue uh, between Muslims uh, and Christians and Jews, especially the, uh, the family of Abraham. Um, here's a statement I quote from him, which is, I, I, I found it uh, interesting and important. Uh, similarly, for example, now Muslims and <coughs> Catholics uh, just yesterday came from Cleveland. We had uh, uh, the 19th Midwest Catholic Muslim Dialogue. <laughs> 
the 19, so it has been going on for 19 years. Uh, it was uh, at our university, at John Carroll University. And these are some uh, pictures. Uh, Gulen with Pope John Paul, uh, with Patriarch Bartholomew, with Israel Sephardic Chief Rabbi Eliyahu Bakshi Doron. And these are some other pictures of Muslims uh, actively involved in dialogue. Uh, I think uh, this one was in Boston, the upper one. Uh, it was the second annual uh, Muslim Baptist dialogue, which is not very usual. So the dialogue is going on. Uh, Dr. Sayyid is very much active in dialogue, and he is in Washington, by the way. Some of you know him. Uh, this was... Um, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who uh, on one occasion destroyed the bridges, but then he repaired <laughs> them and went to Istanbul and visited a uh, 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 blue mosque in Istanbul with the Mufti of Istanbul. And final thoughts. Um, i like to have one quote from the book. May I have uh, to share with you? And I will finish with this, and then, and then uh, um, we will have a question-answer session. This is the final uh, paragraph uh, from my conclusion. Uh, the current trend of interfaith solidarity is a great step toward a peaceful future for humanity. It can be argued that when the prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, said that Jesus will come as a just ruler, he emphasized the importance of justice and peace on earth. If the trend toward dialogue and cooperation leads to justice and peace in our world, it will mean the fulfillment of the messages of both Muhammad and Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon you. Thank you very much. <laughs>